field. On the program today, we have Jerry Zubai, who is the uh, founder and uh, executive director of the Rupendo Women's Foundation. And we have uh, uh, Robert Griffiths, Griff for Gov, who is running as a uh, Jeffersonian Democrat for the governor position in the state of California. And of course, we've got Janine DeRose, who is running for uh, California Senate. Uh, Janine, why are you running for Senate, and why are you running as a libertarian? Well, I'm a libertarian, Good. so that would okay. answer the second part of that question. Um, the focus of our campaign is actually to change the way that people think about politics. So we ask of our politicians just to be not more horrible than the last or the other ho horrible politician that you're voting against, so the lesser of two evils that's commonly referred to as. And we want people to actually uh, get to know their candidates, to um, believe in them, to feel inspired by them, and to actually demand that they do a great job upholding the Constitution, which is what they're taking an oath to do. You're talking about the state of California's Constitution. It, you actually take an oath to both. Oh, really? Yeah, when you go and file your paperwork, you have to state an oath to the Constitution. How does the California Constitution improve upon the, the, uh, the uh, federal Constitution, do you know? Well, it's quite lengthy. Okay. Yeah, they added a whole bunch of stuff. Um, my preference would be the streamlined version. Um, California Constitution is quite lengthy. It's, we have an entire book. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, tell us about a little bit about your Democratic uh, opponent. Uh, that would be the incumbent uh, Dr. Richard Payne, the pedi pediatrician, right? He is. So he definitely has a different perspective from me. I'm very like holistically minded when it comes to health care. So when, um, when you have a difference of opinion, it's totally acceptable to say, you know, we can agree to disagree. However, when one party mandates their preferences and you don't have any way to fight back, there's no longer agree to disagree. There's a violation of your rights and your um, personal sovereignty and your parental rights and all kinds of stuff starts to come into play. So I've noticed that he's definitely more interested in kind of big government solutions and I'm more interested in you know, minimizing the role of government in people's lives so that we can kind of thrive and pro prosper on our own accord. Give me an example of a, a government solution to a health care issue that Richard Penn would be uh, uh, on the opposite side of the issue than you. Well, basically all of them, but his most recent bill, uh, which was really interesting to me, is SB 1424, and it required a third party, party verification of all information shared on social media. So if you posted something on, if you're like a independent journalist, which we have many of now um, <laughs> out in the world, and you post a video or an article, you would have to have a staff with a, a third party verification um, uh, component. And if you didn't, your post would either be banned or it would come with a warning. So the amazing thing is that when it comes to like children's rights and uh, you know parental rights and sort of like the family unit that was under attack for so many years by his bills, people were like, oh yeah, that's awkward. We're not gonna touch that. But you go after Facebook and everybody lost their minds. They've actually converted that bill into an advisory committee now because he couldn't get headway on it. It okay, just wasn't moving forward. Let me, let me see if forward. I understand correctly. He was talking about essentially a First Amendment violation, sounds like. Yes. Uh, saying and it even went so far as to say that private messages were included. Okay, and this would be in effect a way of uh, institutionalizing all media access. So it, it's, it listed out a, a tenets, right? And, and part of that was like, you have to have, uh, so there's a network of third party verifiers, very similar now who are, to Snopes. Well, who, are, who are third party verifiers? Who are, so the, are Snopes. The so like you would go okay. to Snopes and you would like, type in an issue and it would come up and it would tell you whether or not it's true, right? Like but Snopes doesn't have an opinion. Exactly, like they're not biased in any way. Yeah. So, but hmm. the problem is that that network of third party verifiers that we have currently is actually funded by Soros. So it's definitely got a political bias. So to have that be mandated that this is like a law in California that you have to use this kind of service, it's just so out there and people really fought back and now that it's turned into an advisory board. Let me, he really let didn't me, get any let, legs let me, it. let me ask, he was seriously trying to say that George Soros would be the, uh, the censor for all of California media? Oh, he would definitely not say that. He's actually very effect, tactically wise and what he did is he said, 
you know, third party verification, eradicate fake news, all of that verbiage. Okay, so this is a, a campaign against fake news. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, but then what it, what draws to my mind instantly is who determines what's fake and what's real, mm -hmm. and who determines what's acceptable and what's not. And currently, the vibe that I get from our media is that everything about me is unacceptable, and so I don't want anything to do with that, right? So I'm going to fight against that. I'm, I mean, a lot of people fought against that because there's so many people making their living right now as alternative media. They have a presence, if you will, or they have, you know, a following and it, they would basically be shut down because right now they're doing it on their own. Most of them are a one person operation. So if all of a sudden you have, you're required to have a staff, it's just a way of weeding out people who aren't, you know, institutionally acceptable. And by institutionally acceptable, you mean institutionally acceptable to uh, mainstream, more, more or less uh, liberal, center, center left uh, media. Yes, <clears throat> and awkwardly, um, it actually placed greater controls on individuals than media has. So we used to have like journalistic integrity and you know these things that were like journalism was like uh, on a plat you know on a um, pedestal. We really believed that journalists were telling us the truth. It, obviously, we've seen a decline in that, but it would actually put greater controls on what you and I share on Facebook than what they have. And what I thought long term is they were eventually going to be subject to those too, and I'm sure they got pushed back. Okay, so uh, what other issues you said you mentioned something about health issues. Yeah, he's definitely um, brought in his medical perspective into the Senate. And the way that that's manifested is that he's passing laws that actually increases revenue in his private practice, which is illegal. You're not allowed to do that. And it also diminishes the rights of people that he feels like aren't the majority. So he's basically diminishing minority rights because he, has, he says he has the, um, the, the majority on his side. But that's not the role of the Senate. The role of a senator is supposed to keep their, they're supposed to keep their oath to office, uh, to the Constitution, and they're also supposed to um, ensure liberties, not destroy the concept of having liberty in America. So he's just basically taking the old concept of democratic mob rule to its ultimate end. Uh, right. Yes, yes, he has. And, and that's what his supporters talk about um, when I see them kind of like coalescing on Facebook and really like, you call it trolling, but that's jargon for just going in and, you know, bombarding people who don't agree with them. And their, their argument is, well, the majority of the people in his district want it. First of all, the district is a million people, half a million voters. There's no way he knows what the majority of people in his district want. Um, secondly, regardless of if 100% of, or well, maybe 95%, if 95% of the people wanted something to, that would infringe on the rights of 5% of the people, you're supposed to be the adult in the room and say, no, this isn't right. You're not supposed to be the one instigating it. Okay. So I feel like he's failed us in California, and it really prompted me to step up and, you know, throw my name in the hat. Tell us about your Republican opponent. <laughs> well, um... <laughs> We had a Republican candidate come forward, and he was, um, he's very different than myself in the way that he presents his campaign, and he um, ended up not getting, he, he turned in his paperwork on time, but he had copied sheets in color, so they didn't realize, the registrar didn't realize, and it was like four o'clock the day of filing. So he actually turned in multiple sheets of the same page, and so he ended up not getting enough signatures to, to qualify. Mm -hmm. So then he blamed me somehow. I don't really understand how I had anything to do with that, but that's <coughs> besides the point. It was really interesting. Um, but then he also blamed the registrar, and he took her to court, but he also failed to serve it, her uh, properly for court. So the judge couldn't legally hear the case. And then there was another hearing. And after that, um, he declared, I guess, that he's going to do a writing campaign. So I guess that's where it's at. It's really hard to take him seriously the way that he's continually to, he also failed to file his financial in investment paperwork. So it's really hard to take him seriously as a candidate. I don't feel like he's taking this campaign seriously. So on the June ballot, you and Pan are the only two names on the ballot. No, there's no. four. Okay. So um, I'm on the ballot as a libertarian. Yeah. 
There's someone on as no party preference, okay. formerly Green Party. There's someone on as Democrat, okay. and then the incumbent. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the, so the uh, incumbent has Democratic Party uh, competition as well as uh, formerly Green uh, Independent uh, competition. And you. you never know what's going to happen in an election, but I think competition is like a real loose use of that word. Um, the Democrat candidate is a very interesting character that doesn't appear to be running a serious campaign. I could be wrong. Um, I don't know because when you go to fill in the <coughs> bubble, you know, Pan doesn't have wide support. He actually wasn't, you know, in the Democrat Party, if their incumbents are doing a great job, they kind of give them the automatic endorsement. He didn't receive that. He had to go to the convention and actually request endorsement. He did get a, the endorsement there at the convention, but he didn't get the automatic endorsement. So it very likely a lot of people who are, because Pan is, it, uh, our current Senator Pan is funded by um, similar people that fund Hillary Clinton and he's very tied in with that kind of crowd. So the people who feel like Bernie was, you know, not treated fairly by the Democratic Party are really upset and they might do a protest vote. You don't know. So I don't know how it's all going to shake out, but he's really not a serious candidate. And if he ends up being our future senator, I, I, I don't know what to tell people. <laughs> it would be not good. Okay. Tell us a little bit about the district, District 6. District 6 runs from North Natomas over to a little below North Highlands, down through Carmichael on Walnut Avenue. Uh, that's the border. Uh, down through South Sac, like Bradshaw, all the way down to South Sac and over to Elk Grove and up through West Sac. Okay, so it's a good, pretty good size, uh, uh, mostly urban district. It includes all of Central South Sacramento and South Sacramento? Yes. And the Thomas? Yes. It's, it, and, it's and, and West Sacramento? And West Sac. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's a little piece of YOLO. So we mm -hmm. did, you know, when we did our candidate statement, we, did, we filed in Sac County and YOLO. Okay. And uh, I'm guessing that it w that would be pretty highly uh, populated by state workers? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have a lot of state workers, but it's an extremely diverse district. I mean, there it's you drive across Sacramento and you're going through hundreds of different types of communities. So it's an incredibly diverse uh, district. A million people, I, it would be. It's going to be a microcosm, right? I mean, you're going to have a black community in Oak Park. You're going to have a Vietnamese community uh, down around 47th Street. You're going to have a Chinese community over uh, Greenhaven area. You're going to have uh, you know, a whole lot of different uh, variations. Uh, Washington, West Sacramento. So mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of different ethnic groups represented, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and I, and, I, and I think most people, I could be wrong, um, I don't think I am, but I, f I feel like no matter who I've talked to, I, I haven't met one person yet who actually was able to get a meeting with their senator in this district, and I feel like people don't feel represented. And that's something that I want to change. We're hosting community breakfasts. We want to do town halls. We want people to start engaging because it's so diverse. How can one person sit in their office and determine that they know what's best for a million people, um, especially when they're t making such bold moves, without reaching out and speaking with their communities? You know, it, it's very selective outreach. So we're hoping to kind of draw people in and get a higher voting percentage well, it's very a terrible voter turnout in these areas, and I think it's because people feel like it's already figured out. You know, they already they don't have a choice. It doesn't matter if they don't agree. So in this district, it's forty nine percent Democrat, it's twenty percent Republican, twenty three percent no party preference. Like more people have chosen not to choose a party than have chosen Republican, and then the eight percent other. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of people who feel like the system isn't really including them, and that's who we're hoping to reach. And uh, what are the issues? You said uh, Senator Pan is out of touch with his constituents on some issues. What issues are you referring to? Like human issues. Like he's just really not, he doesn't engage with people. He doesn't seem to sit down with his constituents and ask what's going on. And that's largely because he's funded by very big corporations, and that's where he gets his marching orders from. He doesn't go to the people and ask them what they need in their community. He's already got his marching orders. To the point that a, a representative from um, Common Sense Media, which is a very well-known thing in the parenting community, um, actually they send a rep to 
some of his events that re-answers his questions after he answers because it's not close enough to what their dialogue is. And that was during SB 18, wherein he crafted a bill. I don't know if he wrote it or somebody else wrote it. Um, and it said, if you can't provide uh, optimal conditions for your children as defined by the state, they will be removed from your home. And there was a whole list of um, ch you know, children's rights things, including like pre-K, the bond you have with your children, the medical care you provide for your children, um, their living conditions, all of these factors. And it was kind of run at the same time as a bill where they would actually go in and review your home environment for you. I don't know about you, but if you've ever been to DMV, um, I don't want the state doing anything in my house. I don't want any of their efficiency or um, like their the way that they so operate. Let me, let me, I don't let need me, in my is, life. This is, this is a proposal by Pam that, that government bureaucrats would come into people's homes and make a decision as to whether people were parenting well enough and if not, take their kids away? So it was coupled. There were two bills running concurrently, and one of them was the um, home inspection, and one of them was SB 18, which was the list of defined parameters that, that qualified as optimal conditions for children. And if you did not meet the optimal con conditions, you were in danger of losing your kids. It was, yeah, it's easier for CPS to step in and take over. Okay. And now we know that in California, there's a huge amount of CPS abuse of the mm -hmm. system. Uh, Tremendous yeah. amounts. Yeah. Right. All over the country, actually. But, I mean, but this sounds like 1984 or Orwellian, <laughs> where they come in and take your kids Trust because me, the I cereal <laughs> they're eating isn't right? I mean, that's ridiculous. And who defines the conditions? That's the other thing that was really interesting to me. Like, who defines them? But it's kind of like the, what was it, the Affordable Care Act. You, you don't know what's in it until after it's passed. They, right. they define it afterwards through a bureaucratic method. Mm -hmm. And so I felt really uncomfortable with that, as did many parents in California. Is Elk Grove in, the, uh, in your district? I'm sorry? Elk Grove. Is that in your district? Yeah. Okay. You're from Elk Grove, right? Yes, I am. Do you have questions for your, your future <laughs> senator? Uh, it's <laughs> <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. And it's actually very interesting that um, all the points that you've brought across because when it comes to the senator, it's one of those candidates you just, you never hear from them, you don't know what's going on, and you almost kind of just ignore, mm -hmm. you know, and hearing what she's saying and all these things that are coming up, I'm thinking, oh no, we can't have that. So mm -hmm. my question to you, um, as Senator, what, what would you, you know, pertaining to women, you know, especially homeless women, um, what, 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 what do you have that you can provide for them to make sure, that, because for my part, I deal with feminine hygiene solutions. Yeah. What do you have in, in place that can, we can make sure that those women are not neglected? Because if they're just humans just like you and I, they're going through the same process like you and I. So what do you have in place of that to make sure, even if they're homeless, that they can be able to uh, reach and get the you know, <coughs> feminine hygiene needs that they, they need while they're still on the streets? That's a great question. And I'm kind of I'm gonna approach it from the other side of the problem, which is why do we have such a high homeless rate? Mm -hmm. Because it's one thing to like so, you know, a certain percentage of people will make the choice that that's how they feel comfortable living, and that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But our homeless rate has increased 38 percent in the Sacramento area in six months. That's a startling increase. Mm -hmm. On top of that, rents are skyrocketing. So one of the things that I found out in trying to figure out this issue, because I actually am writing up a plan specifically for homelessness, mm -hmm. and one of the things I found out is that there's a land use fee of 45000 to 95000 on every home built. So before you can break ground, you're paying uh, you know, upwards of $100,000. That's going to tack 100000 on to every project. So that prohibits building. So we have a, a housing crisis that now they want to fix with rent control which is like putting a tiny Band-Aid on a gaping wound. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make any sense at all. Then you have people being prohibited from working because they can't meet the threshold. What I call the minimum wage is a threshold of, of skill. So if you don't meet that threshold of skill, you're not going to get a job. Not only that, there's going to be a competitive bottleneck at that threshold. So then we're prohibiting people from working on top of the licensing things that we're going to talk about later. Yeah, well, let's get so, into that. Uh, uh, one of the uh, existing libertarian senators, Laura Ebke, senator mm -hmm. from uh, Nebraska, 
uh, was elected as a Republican, but uh, decided that she could no longer put up with some of the antics of the Republicans in Nebraska and <laughs> changed her re voter registration and her party to Libertarian. Very bravely. And uh, she is now, uh, she just uh, recently uh, w went through a jungle primary, uh, again a top two primary mm -hmm. in Nebraska, where she came in in the top two, even though the Republican governor uh, threw bukus of money uh, uh, in b behind uh, her chief uh, uh, Republican opponents. She won anyway. And one of the things that she did that made a name for herself in her district and in the state <coughs> was she put together a tripartisan uh, uh, regulatory reform bill to uh, fix the problem of occupational licensing. You mentioned occupational licensing. Uh, in, in Nebraska, there, as in California, there are dozens, probably hundreds of prof professions that are mm -hmm. licensed. You can't do them unless you have the, essentially the, uh, the uh, approval of the people who are already in that, in that particular business. In Nebraska, it went to the uh, point of saying that you could not massage a horse. You could not be hired to massage a horse unless you were a veterinarian. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and if you did deign to massage a horse, you were subject to, I think it was a $10,000 fine and five years in jail or something like that. It was a ridiculous, a ridiculous penalty. Wow. She, you know, and there are dozens of, of those things from florists to beauticians to barbers to uh, home handymen to carpenters and plumbers, you, know, you name it. Every, uh, essentially every labor profession uh, had managed to create a guild in Nebraska so that the people who were practicing the profession could effectively deny the uh, ability for anybody else to, to practice the profession and thus provide competition. She put together essentially a sunset law, which said that over the next five years, 20% of all regulations uh, regulating licensing in, in, in Nebraska would be reviewed and the least intrusive method would be used to uh, uh, regulate uh, those professions going forward, ideally the free market. Is that something that you would feel comfortable doing in, in California? That would be amazing. That would be revolutionary in California. I mean, just as a, a beginning st start, it's a start for me. Um, but it would be huge in California because of the resistance that you would meet, but it would also open up professions. And on. so that's like fixing the root of the problem, right? Fixing those things is the root of the problem. But in the meantime, we need to bring in like literally high level effective homeless solutions and and there's two things one we have examples throughout the u.s that are working where not only do you provide you know basic what you you know better i mean conditions you, you wouldn't leave like a pet on the street in the conditions that we're expecting people to live in so providing like you know basic human needs and then also a pathway to getting um clean if there's a drug problem, getting um, job training, whatever is needed in that area, mental health you know, services. And what I would prefer to see personally is a, a public-private partnership because I think when you see the public solutions, oftentimes they're, they're very tied up in bureaucracy and it doesn't actually end up helping the pe people that it's supposed to and all the money goes to line pockets and it doesn't actually get down to the people that need the help. Mm -hmm. So that public-private partnership means that you have invested donors who are going to make sure that program mm -hmm. is taken care of and they're your citizens in the community. Um, specifically for women, I would actually like one of my projects that I want to do is start um, uh, like uh, homes for women to start to like heal, like learn, you know, how do we care for our children? How do we do these things that are um, instead of looking to the government for services, how do we kind of close our community and actually start um, healing within and providing help and guidance to people, especially young women. We have horrific rates of human trafficking in Sacramento. It's one of the you know, national hubs. It's absolutely horrible. So all of these issues are incredibly important and that's where our focus should be, not on how can we take people's kids away because they're not doing what we want them to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's much you, better you, use yeah, of the you, time. Yeah, you mentioned that there's a high um, a correlation, I guess, between drug use and being homeless, which I'm sure is probably There can true. be. I'm sure there's plenty uh, of people who use yeah. drugs who aren't homeless, but it just, yeah. if that's a a lot, a lot of the people on the, on the streets are there are also, uh, uh, have problems with drugs. And we have a huge, a huge amount of people who are is, veterans. Yeah. Is that uh, related to the fact that drugs are illegal for the most part, other than marijuana, in California? 
Well, for example, if you have a drug offense and you like say you you're not doing any other crimes and you get caught with drugs, you go to prison, you lose oftentimes your family, your livelihood, your home, all of your assets, and you have to come out and start over. And by the way, you can't get any license in California if which you're a felon. Of, which is one of the other uh, aspects of the FP bill in, in Nebraska. Uh, criminal, uh, criminality, past criminality, was not, is no longer a factor in getting a license unless the uh, crime is actually related to the uh, profession that you're trying to get into. Right, and you don't want to you don't want to <clears> get rid of the standards that actually like help prevent you know horrible atrocities. That's yeah. completely irrational. But you can get rid of the standards that don't make any sense for anybody. Like moral turpitude, vaguely defined. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's um, we're very. In, I see California as like upside down land right now, and I just want to <clears> bring <throat> a little bit of practic practicality back, a little bit of like common sense, and just point out these things that it seems like. Most of the politicians that we have are, are motivated by a personal gain or something that they're getting out of it, an ego boost or, or um, even you know money from the, the whole process or even the job itself, which is what the other Democrat candidate said is that it would pay more than his current profession. Um, but I want to see politicians step up who have actual leadership skills, who want to better California and not use that position to you know, make money or, or line their own pockets, line their pockets <laughs> or the, even push their agenda. Like it's not about have, that. In the minute we have left, what is the one issue that you are most passionate about and feel like you could actually make a difference? Well, the housing homeless issue is really important to me. I feel like the way we're handling it is terrible currently. But the other issue, we, we spoke about that already. So the other issue that's really important to me is education. I feel like we need to raise our educational standards in California. We're ranked like 44th in the nation, yet our budget does not reflect what that kind of a standard. So um, I'm personally very invested in um, supporting people who have make other choices because right now public school is you know not an optimal choice so how can we bring in the success stories we're having in private school or homeschooling and bring that kind of vibe to the public sector so that we can start to heal there and then also the amount of dollars that go towards direct uh, services to the student is very low the last i checked it was eight cents on the dollar so if our the rest goes to administration, is that exactly the yeah. oversight, administration, yeah. other things, and that's um, really practical solution. That's the show. We'll see you again next week. Vote Janine. Uh, De well, <laughs> we can't say that on this show, but uh, <laughs> consider <laughs> consider voting for Janine DeRose in State Senate Six. Uh, we'll see you again next week, same time, same place, on the Libertarian Counterpoint at www.accesssacramento.org on the uh, web uh, and uh, on Channel 17 in Sacramento, cable channels all over the place, YouTube and Facebook. Thank you very much. See you again next week.